Now, last time we talked about uh, quite a few things. We ran long. I want uh, Phil's here to help me uh, be short of, you know, at an hour, we'll stop. If people want to hang around and ask questions after that time, I'll try to try to do that. Um, if you all would uh, mute your, uh, your microphone. I'm happy to see your glowing faces, but mute your, mute your microphones for now. Um, okay. As I follow the news, both the medical, technical, and then the more general, the thing that's uh, striking to me, and I don't know if it's been obvious to you, but maybe it is, is this virus is represented as some bizarre new thing that has all kinds of, you know, un unknown, previously unimaginable kinds of consequences. So the good news, that's not true. It's a virus. It's plain old virus. It happens to have a relatively normal spectrum of effects on inflammation and immune uh, function and um, energetic, cellular energetic. Uh, everybody turn off your microphone, please. Um, that said, it does have some unique properties which we need to think about. But I want you to kind of get this boogeyman out of your mind if you can. Uh, it's a relatively straightforward spectrum, clinical spectrum. You'll read things about, oh, young people have strokes, and then we have this bizarre new expression of Kawasaki's disease in children. Quite frankly, we've seen that with other viruses, so even those kinds of things would seem uh, extreme uh, we've seen before. So don't, don't get too focused on that. No, so, bad news, it's a virus. But again, it's not Ebola, which has uh, you know, much, much, much higher lethality. Um, so try to um, put in mind the idea that we're not dealing with some exotic, bizarre, beyond experience kind of thing. It's bad. I'm not trying to minimize that. And I'll talk about that in detail. But again, just start with a foundational understanding. It's a virus. There's nothing new about that. <clears throat> now, in terms of how to understand your risk and your future and how your super future behavior will unfold, keep a couple things in mind. One, as we've talked about before, all of the statistics do not make sense in any simple sense. And the reason why they don't is we're dealing with multiple strains. And uh, the two large strain variants that people have identified or talked about as the Chinese variant and the European variant. But in point of fact, we have more than those two, but those are the two dominant ones. Understand this. Uh, keep in mind that the R naught, last time I talked about the CDC paper, which was citing uh, phone uh, information out of China, they had an R naught of the five to eight range, which one meant for every one person, five to eight people would be infected. What probably I should clarify is R naught, which can be defined strictly as how many people you're exposed to and so on and so forth, is actually a very squishy number. And down at the bottom, you'll see on my page, I hope you can, it says demographics, demographics, demographics. Let me, by a reductio ad absurdum, show you this. For example, one person has a terrible disease, but they're, uh, they never see anybody and they're never around any other person, then their r not is gonna be basically zero. So their behavior impacts what that r not's like. If you're a very congenial, convivial, uh, perhaps Italian, we've got some reasons to think about that, then your r not, how long you're contagious, how many people have contact, come in contact, is gonna be impacted by that behavior. So don't get locked into, gee, if one person has it, one, two, three, or 10 people will get it's not that simple. And this is where behavior impacts it. Next thing is lethality. Uh, almost, there's some convergence of thought that the lethality is about 0.5%. I don't think we really have evidence to support that number. I think it may be higher, but it's certainly not 10 or 15 or 20 or anything like, for example, the Ebola. So it's lethality, again, if you be quite clear about it, is a function of demographics. Um, so for example, if you look at the cumulative effect of COVID in the United States, it per currently is taking somewhere between 0.4 and 0.7 per 100,000 people. Now that's not very low, given that the death, the, lethal, the, the morbidity, the mortality in the United States 
roughly is 900 per 100,000. You can see it's a tiny part of that total number. What? <laughs> well, the 0.7 is very low. Okay, so he's, Phil's correcting me, and I will assume for the moment that he's in this rare occasion, right? No, when I'm playing, you're supposed to laugh. Um, so if a 0.7 per 100,000 or 0.4 per 100,000 is the current uh, rate of uh, lethality, it's really very, very low. If you consider that the, the approximately 900 per 100,000 die per year, from all causes, you can see where that would rank. If you look at it in terms of an actual number where it's gonna to project to the number of who will die over the course of the next year, <clears throat> it comes in, in the third, fourth, or fifth place. It's not, a, it's not a small number. But again, keep in, in mind how many people die from heart disease and cancer and so on and so forth. So kind of calibrate that sense of risk. Okay, so that's the r naught. that's the lethality, that's the strains. Now, the next thing is to understand what are called acute phase reactants. The reason why you care about acute phase reactants, it's one thing if the disease directly causes, you know, severe lung disease or severe uh, microvascular disease. But here's the other issue, and that's where these acute phase reactants come into play. Now, we track a lot of acute phase reactants normally in terms of our testing. That would be fibrinogen as acute phase reactant, C-reactive protein as acute phase reactant, uh, ferritin is, there's a bunch of them. What an acute phase reactant is, it's something many of which are produced by the liver that is saying the body as a whole is dealing with some kind of a challenge that the body interprets, the liver primarily interprets that the best physiological response is a cascade of anti-inflammatory, inflammatory, inflammatory slash anti-inflammatory proteins, molecules, enzymes, <clears throat> and that cascade is gonna help the body fight whatever this perceived enemy might be. In point of fact, those acute phase reactants can also trigger strokes, can trigger uh, heart attacks and other microvascular and macrovascular disease. So acute phase reactants are part of the not direct effect of the disease, but a downstream effect. Let me illustrate. For example, you get your teeth cleaned. All of the, or most of the acute phase reactants will be elevated. Why? The body has had this in, inundation of bacteria from the teeth cleaning and the body's gearing up to fight those. That's why, for example, in the first week or two after you having your teeth cleaned, there's a slight increase in your risk of stroke or heart attack in that window, even though annually over the course of a year, you might actually have a decrease in that risk because you had your teeth cleaned. So keep in mind that's another element of risk and it should be understood as small and it shouldn't be thought of as something bizarre or different. It's unique to, it's not unique to this particular disease. Now, understanding another aspect of your risk is where we get into this, and I've listed the super spreaders, the micro droplets, fomites, and secretions. These are the way we think about how do we get this. Now, for example, last time I talked to you about uh, what was called skier's disease in Germany, because that was an importation of the disease from the Austrian Alps and they were, because most of that came from uh, skiers, they thought it was of skiers disease. But what that was an example of is a super spreader or probably multiple super spreaders, but any event, a super spreader. In other words, there was probably, if I were gonna guess in a, in a ski resort setting, a bartender or somebody like that had the disease, coughed on people and spread these large droplets and everybody got, many people got it and then they took it back to Germany and spread it to more people. So there are what we would call super spreaders and those are where tracking, you know, testing and tracking makes sense as long as it's a scalable activity. I do not believe, this is my opinion, I think I'm right, that tracking and tracing makes any sense on a national basis for the United States. There's too many people involved. There's too many people. There's too much of the disease already, you know, aberrantly, in other words, variantly uh, distributing the population that that's probably not effective. Now, if you have a particular area and you see a pattern, that would be worth doing. But keep in mind, at least the, uh, those of us in Santa Clara County, 
I mean, we just have almost zero risk. There have been less than 140 deaths since it started happening. That's around a 20% increase uh, mortality in the county during that period of time. It's really not much. And so whatever the are not functional, the lethality, the acute phase, secondary reactions, it's just not many people. And so keep in mind that statistical risk. I ask again, you turn off your, uh, your speakers, I mean your uh, microphone. <clears throat> so one way is the super spreader. Now the micro droplets, and that's where we talk about the aerosolization, just in, <clears throat> in breathing or something like that in the air, and you might be exposed as you pass through that. This is less dramatic. They will all get down to, you notice this next point I'm talking about is infectious dose. The other issues, of course, are fomites. We talked about fomites last time, although I searched for the word and got it before we were done. Those are the intermediate objects that have the virus on them. Um, this is on, on, on the floor, or on the grass, and that sort of thing. Um, <coughs> the other is secretions in general, which, of course, is where super spreading and micro droplets and fomites get their infectious components. But keep in mind that that's the exchange of saliva and uh, sexual secretions and so on and so forth. So you have this other way of potentially spreading the disease. The one that we think about, uh, the one that everyone focuses on is the super spreader environment. But for a lot of people, the micro droplet issue is of importance as are fomites. Now, all of those depend on infectious dose. At this point, we do not know how many virions, how many viruses it takes to give the infection somebody. Anyways, with any other infection, that number will vary with the immune status of the, of the, of the host. But it seems like it's probably a lower number than we were afraid of at one point. So it may not be a lot of transmission through aerosolized air. In other words, you walk through an area where someone was simply breathing and they exhale that and you would smell it the same, or you might not smell it, but you might notice the same way you'd notice someone smoking a cigar and would smell that. That's this aerosolized dis dispersal. That may not be as big an issue as we were concerned about because the infectious dose is relatively small. So when you start a calculus of your own risk, think how these things bear on your behavior. So if the R0, for example, connects to the super spreaders, you know, if you're in a bar or you're in a restaurant and someone coughs and they have a high viral burden and they may not, but if they have a high viral burden, you're in a super spreader environment and that one person can give it to many, many people in that one setting. So that might let that go into your calculation of risk. Um, the micro droplets issue, you know, if you're on a heavy hiking trail, that might be an issue. There could be enough people that hike through there that exhaled enough that there could be some issues there. The fomites remain for all of us. You know, did you use the handrail after somebody and then you wiped your eyes or face, which we all do? Keep those kinds of main. So when you start your own calculus of risk, think about super spreaders, micro droplets, fomites, secretions. And then I think that you can come up with probably a non-scary rational way to think about relative risk and the behavior you need to adopt to minimize that risk, okay? Uh, again, infectious dose, if we had an actual number of virion number, it's, it's 12 or six or a million, whatever the number is, we'd be able to be more precise about this calculation. But again, just taking Santa Clara County as an example, the risk is statistically remarkably low. We're in a county of around 2 million people. We've had, you know, since the onset, uh, less than 140 deaths. We're way below, um, you know, acute capacity for the hospitals. Could it change? You know, we have an onslaught of super spreaders, uh, maybe, but it doesn't look like an issue. And again, that's just to help you calculate your relative risk. Therapies and immunizations, I'm not at all optimistic about immunizations because we don't have an immunization, you've heard this, for the common cold. Common cold is another coronavirus. And the reason why we all get colds every, you know, every year, every two years, or every five years, except in our middle ages and our middle years, um, is because they're different. And the same way with influenza, which is not a coronavirus, by the way, but 
the reason why we're supposed to get a new shot every year and the CDC guesses which ones they should put in the immunization is they change all the time. There's no reason to believe that's going to be different for this, this array of viruses. Notice I say array, it's not a single one. We already know it's at least two, it's probably more like six to 10 different versions. How much cross immunogenicity there is across that, we don't know at this point. Will immunity to one uh, translate into immunity to all of them? Almost certainly not. Maybe partial immunity, which would decrease its lethality. So this is gonna be a problem. What can be do and what, what can happen, and I'm very excited for, is we're gonna learn an awful lot we would never otherwise have learned about vi viruses and their mechanism of action. Um, the problem a lot of the time with something as serious as this is you've got to work in these, these level four labs and there are not a lot, a lot of personnel and a lot, a lot of facilities in that setting. So you can't really discover as much as the function of these, these viruses and how they unfold in the context of human cells. And so you have to use little pieces of it in the lower list, lower risk. Uh, lab and experiment with how that works. So we still don't really understand there might be a single Achilles heel and a single weak point in these viruses that the uh, uh, antibody uh, will be able to attack. At this point, we don't believe that's the case. So all of the immunizations that are out there are, um, you know, to different ideas of the therapeutic um, um, uh, antigen antibody reactions and we don't know about that yet so we're a long way from really having any kind of secure immunization strategy because we don't have any pros prospects that are well founded that are going to be stable that will work now will it decrease it it will it help yeah there's going to be some help now the therapies at this point um, the remdesivir which everybody's pushing is not that helpful it's certainly better than nothing but I wouldn't want anybody, if they have that idea, to think, oh, gee, I don't have to worry about it. I just get my remdesivir and I'll be fine. That's not that adequate a therapy. Uh, if we have something, it's, at this point, it'll have to be some kind of a cocktail. Um, the only thing you always hear me <laughs> with some confidence uh, urge is zinc. Uh, that does seem to help. But keep in mind, and this is hard to keep in mind, zinc is not helpful used chronically. There is even some indication that chronic use of relatively high dose of zinc will downregulate your immune protection against viruses. So its primary use is in the acute setting. IG, I think I feel like I've got a cold coming on or flu coming on or whatever. Start some zinc then. But just, you know, high dosing zinc because you don't want to have something, it was, well, it, it, it won't help and it might very seriously do harm. So the therapies, immunizations, it's kind of, I guess the phrase people use is meh. It's not that great a news there. Um, but again, back to this thing that I say, do we believe the numbers and what do they tell us? The numbers are so um, incoherent because there's never been a complete uh, wash through of the demographics, you know, you know, somebody of this age with these diseases and so on and so forth, what's their real risk? We still don't have that data. We do have data out of the UK, for example, that uh, a, a very substantial percentage, even the majority, all have diabetes. Well, yeah, and some other data, it's high blood pressure, and other data, it's obesity, which would overlap with diabetes. We don't have enough information to clarify the demographics of who's actually at risk. And so when you hear, oh, gee, 30% of people over X age die, well, that doesn't necessarily apply to you. So don't even let those numbers get you too frightened. Um, it's, it's a real disease, but again, keeping in mind that the R not, the lethality, the acute phase response, all of those are dependent on demographics. How old are you, what your risk factors are, and so on and so forth. So don't have any worries about that part of it. Um, oh, my, my, there it is. Okay. <laughs> the reason why, okay, next thing, exercise and COVID, that was one of the things that I, I propose that we talk about this time. Um, there's some pretty nice data that protection, uh, that vitamin D confers, so I should have mentioned that back on therapies. It's not exactly therapy. As, as most of you know, I'm pretty much of a, of a supplement nihilist, but I've always advocated vitamin D, one, because I'm a 
stark white guy who doesn't get enough sun because I'm covered with skin cancer from a misspent youth. But still, sun and vitamin D do seem to confer some meaningful statistical protection against COVID. So, you know, keep your vitamin D level up. But all of you, or at least all of those of you who are my patients, know we track that one. The reason why I exercise is tied in through a number of mechanisms of being protected. One, we know that's less, that's one way to uh, lessen your risk for just frank obesity. And obesity doesn't mean you're fat. It has to do with one version or another of, of fitness slash fatness. In other words, as you know, there's some people who are very obese or appear to be who are quite fit, quite strong, and have a great cardiopulmonary capacity and high electromechanically function muscles. And those people are fine. It's not about their weight. So what can you do to maximize the exercise effect on protecting you from COVID? Now notice that down here it says, it's the mitochondria again as ever. Teach them to kill or be killed. And I know that's kind of a funny phrase, but what I mean by that is we know that your mitochondria who have their own little genome, their own genetics, which interact with your other genetics. What's nice about them, there's so many in the system that if you overwork them, this is what we call this intense interval work, they literally will commit suicide. They will kill themselves. And when they do that, they actually create an environment where the body can then create a higher functioning mitochondria. So you shift the demographics, the distribution of your mitochondria into a higher functioning, healthier mitochondria. So that's one way you induce through this self-immolation of the bad mitochondria, better mitochondria. Then in what we call some uh, sustained submaximal exercise, there's another way that you can improve mitochondrial function. And that is this um, induced demand on upregulation of the whole chain of uh, enzyme activation that's necessary for the respiratory uh, chain to work. And that's a function that happens within the mitochondria. <coughs> so, by those two types of exercise, intense interval work and sustained submaximal work, you are teaching your mitochondria to kill or be killed, okay? And your mitochondria, the energy system of your cells, that determines a lot of the phase angle, which we measure. The phase angle is how well the electromechanical function of the cells is. And we know from a lot of other data that the higher your phase angle, the, le the more resistant you are to a whole array of serious diseases. And if you train right you and eat right and stay hydrated and a few other things, but primarily train right, you can improve your phase angle. And that's for, by this focus on mitochondrial function. Now, there's a lot more to talk about in that regard, but I want to make sure you hear that distinction between kill them, <laughs> work them to death, or teach them to be more lethal in themselves, more better at their job. Notice I said train your brain too. We have already established that your mental state, and we can get into the chemistry, but your mental state does have a big impact on how well your immune system functions. Depressed person's more at risk for disease. A happy person less at risk for disease. I, I'm sorry it's that crisp and clear, but it makes a difference. And you do in fact have some control over your brain in that sense. And the training will improve your mood as well. Uh, the other part of training your brain is don't forget that your um, hand-eye coordination, foot speed, balance, that's part of training the brain. Just like a muscle, over time, it gets weaker unless you exercise it. So include, include brain, brain training in your uh, address of exercise as part of your, your anti-COVID strategy. Whoop, Phil says I'm not done. <clears throat> Well, <clears throat> yeah, he, okay, Phil, Phil's uh, doing an important thing for me to remember, and that is to emphasize for you that what we do here, what we, you, you and I do together is measure things, and by that objective data, we're able to make meaningful directions. And remember, I talk about the liar in the mirror. <clears throat> the liar in the mirror has come back to visit me in, in my own life in lockdown, and I've seen in most of my patients, he's come back to visit most of you too. Everyone comes, I feel great, I'm doing really well. And they're five pounds up on fat and three pounds down on muscle and their phase angle is worse and their hydration level is worse. That liar in the mirror didn't tell him that. So without actually measuring these things, 
you won't know you're on track. So certainly do your best to meet what we talked about and what you understand is good eyes and good diet and good hydration behavior, but don't count your self perception for that. Measure these things. Um, I, <laughs> maybe <laughs> I'm particularly familiar with the liar in the mirror, and I I know you guys will deny any knowledge of him, but the mirror is not a very good guide, and certainly the scale is isn't. I had a lot of people coming ah the way the same thing I did when the lockdown started. Well, I say yeah. You'll, you gain five pounds of fat and lost five pounds of muscle. That's not the same number. So make sure that you and we together measure things. Um, I, I mentioned when no one else knows how to do this, it turns out I, I would love to know a thousand physicians in the United States who know how to measure these things, but I don't. If you know them, introduce me because I've looked for lots of people for over lots of years and it just isn't done enough. So do measure things. Make your course corrections based with objective data. Did they get me out of trouble with Phil? Okay, types of exercise. Well, I, um, yeah, I don't want to get too far into that. How are we doing on time, by the way? Yeah, we'll talk about particular exercises. I think, I hope that, as you may know, I send out the old training protocols from Tempus. And that's very specific about which exercises for interval training and which exercise for sustained submaximal exercise <clears throat> and, which ex and what kind of exercise for brain training. So I don't want to get too far off in that field. If no one got, if you didn't get the old training uh, Tempest protocols, let me know and I'll, we'll send them out again. They're very, very detailed about what it takes to get sustained interval and submaximal interval training and what it takes to do to build muscle mass and electromechanical functions of cells. <clears throat> um, I may not, this may not be the sales job I should engage in, but Phil and I used to refer to the interval training as the fall off and puke protocol. In other words, it's pretty serious. It's very intense, but it's very short. And uh, to get that kind of intense interval, and we know done properly, You've just killed off the weak sisters in your, or brothers, in your mitochondrial spectrum, and then the body will give you some better ones. And so that's a very important part of this process. Um, I'm going to let that be it for now. Uh, Phil's going to have to, I'm going to have to put this down so we can look at uh, questions, which we'll get to. The next thing I want to talk to you about is notice I say the four things you can't live without, and it's there in sequence. You more quickly without air than lack of sleep. To many people's surprise, you will die more quickly without sleep than without water, and you will die more quickly without water than food. So the sleep water, most people get the air thing. You can't hold your breath for long. Very few people understand the power of sleep. But what we know is true dense insomnia, someone who does not, does not lose consciousness and is entirely alert and vigilant, will not live more than two days without sleep. Now, that's not what most people think of as being awake. We're kind of vague and in and out of consciousness and not entirely alert, and then we can't remember what we just thought of. That's not this dense insomnia that I'm talking about. Truly, awakeness, we don't have much tolerance for. And what that's alerting us to is how important sleep is. That extreme case maybe doesn't seem like it tells the whole story, but it reveals how deep the body needs sleep. So sleep is an important one. What I've noticed is very few people having problems understanding the importance of air. Many more people have trouble understanding the importance of sleep, sleep quality. That's where this disruption, this lockdown has been interfered with a lot of my patients. A lot of the people I've talked to is they've let their biological clock unwind. Their the body, just like any uh, you know adolescent, we all want to stay up later and get up later and maybe even nap and so on and so forth. We take, we, we let slip sleep hygiene. So don't do that. Water, I'm emphasizing more water, but the real issue there is hydration. As we've talked about before, your uh, collection of you know, 10 or 12 trillion cells, most of which bacteria, but the rest of the cells in you, uh, that constitute you, how well they work, how well they resist infection, how well they provide energy for your day is how well they're hydrated. They're just nanoscale batteries 
And all anybody who's messed around with batteries knows if there's not enough water in there to keep the ion concentration intact and within the boundaries of the battery, the battery doesn't work very well. So hydration is huge. You really have to pay attention to hydration. And again, in a day that's free running where we don't have built in, you know, breaks every half hour or something like that, people forget to drink water, people forget to do these kind of self-maintenance issues. And that gets to food. Food, as we talked about last time, this has to be a um, nutrient-dense food. It should uh, respect the biological needs of the body. The body wants to eat first thing in the morning because it hasn't eaten for a while. Eat a big breakfast, smaller lunch, smaller dinner, make it nutrient-dense, and make it anti-inflammatory. Now, anti-inflammatory is going to help with the body's immune response, the body's risk for cardiovascular disease, and the things that raise insulin, for example, are inflammatory. Insulin is an, is an inflammatory molecule. It interferes oh, with nitric. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, somebody talking here. Turn, turn your. Uh, That's where it gets expensive. Uh, turn your microphone off. Um, yeah. ins Hello? Turn your, your microphone off. Um, insulin itself is an inflammatory inducing, it blocks. Uh, the endothelia, the cells production of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is very important for the compliance, the flexibility the, of the arteries. So stay away from insulin stimulating foods unless you're one of those people and they're out there and you know who, most of you know who you are, who truly are super insulin sensitive and will tend to have too low on insulin. Don't need that either. But overall, insulin is an example of inflammatory food behavior. So keep away from that. So air, sleep, water, food, those are important for your health going forward, your longevity, and your susceptibility to COVID. Now notice I mentioned this thing in the new silence. I've, <laughs> many of you heard me say I saw all three things, proper exercise, proper diet, and a spiritual discipline. Most of you know I'm not peddling religion when I say spiritual discipline. I'm talking about rhythm, movement, breathing and interior silence. And that state of inner, sil of inner silence is only obtained by practice. You have to work at it. And it's one of the few words where I really emphasize people have to have the discipline. So the discipline of inner silence comes from mastering, I don't care if it's meditation, contemplation, the rosary, Qigong, it is a discipline. It has to be engaged in on an almost daily basis. And it can't be done when needed. It has to have been done before then. And in this practice of inner silence, this new silence, you practice presence. I'm here now. And hopefully you can find or renew meaning and purpose. Because biology, this is the nature of humans, is probably just as true of dogs as it is of humans. If you don't have that experience of silence and presence and an understanding of meaning and purpose, we don't live very long or we don't live very well. And so this time where our schedules are disrupted is a unique and important opportunity to really learn how to practice that new silence. And in that silence, experience presence and discover again, uh, renew again, meaning and purpose. So these are all things around this notion. Now notice this is carpe diem. Everybody knows that from an old Robin Williams movie, or maybe they learned it from an, <laughs> a more uh, classical reference. But the idea is that. I'm concerned as people are kind of beat down by this process, I'm seeing it in, my, in you guys that you're kind of slipping on the diet and you're kind of slipping on the exercise and your biological clock is slipping and you're letting the day slip out of your grip. Grab the day, grab it, make this a great opportunity. I think it can be a personal opportunity for all of us. I think it can actually be a great opportunity for all of us. And I mean that in the, in the corporate or state sense. Um, the other thing is a great opportunity to learn more about the biology of many diseases. So this is really kind of an exciting, I'm a doc, we get excited about funny things. I think it's a really exciting time, but don't lose the day. Carpe diem, grab the day. Um, I think that's all of the stuff on that. And that was just kind of an outline of some things I want to talk to you about. Um, I'm supposed to get to some questions. I want to know how to do that again. Where is it? Um, okay, Phil has, how are we doing on time? <clears throat> okay. 
how do we get Chapman? So we've got a list. Phil's fiddling around with the mouse, so maybe he'll discover it. Um, so some of the questions sort of fit together, but I'll, did you lose it? Yeah, there it is. So um, there's a question about, apparently there's, Phil knows the, the reference, I don't, where people have seen this notion of putting coffee filters in a, a bandana. And actually that's an important issue back in the super spreaders and the micro droplets to understand. Um, <clears throat> There is no perfect isolation outside of a level four lab. And as you know, even those there are sometimes mistakes. So your, your measure, don't measure your behavior against an impossible perfect, okay? So if you have anything over your face under certain conditions where you think it might be exposed, that's better than nothing. And then the more you can add some layer of protection, the better and more likely it's to be effective. But even with a bandana with or without a coffee filter, that doesn't protect the mucous membranes in your eyes or you touching the side of your face. So whatever will help you at least provide some level of protection, that's a step up and you should be, should be glad you're doing that. The coffee filters are kind of an interesting idea and they do add some level of screening. And so if you want to put a coffee filter inside of a bandana and put it as long, by the way, I see a lot of people with, with masks on, but not covering their nose. I, I'm not sure what they're thinking, but that's a bad idea. So if that's, a, if that's in doubt on anybody, you got to cover your nose as well. I mean, Phil and I, we see it every day. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed. So to specifically address the bandana and coffee filter, sure, it's worth doing. It's way better than doing nothing. Is it the equivalent of an M95, N95 mask? No, it's not. Um, but a lot of times, um, if you think of it in terms of other people's risk being around you, Almost anything is adequate as long as, I mean, you just, except for the extreme examples of aerosolized uh, uh, viruses. Again, keeping in mind, I don't think it's a very, it's a pretty high virion count to communi uh, communicate the disease. That's probably good, pretty good protection for others. So anything, uh, and by the way, the N95s aren't that great. As you know, if you've ever sealed one on the sides, and I've done that sometimes, you basically can't breathe. So there are some uh, metri metrics between I can't breathe and I'm better off than nothing. And you should experiment with that. What you can, what your company, I have bad lungs, so I'm bad CO2. So if I have an N95 on very long, my CO2 goes through the roof. It's just an example. You have to figure out what's, what's uh, practical for you. Um, again, I'm looking at the list he's got for me. Yeah. Some question about um, testing frequency, testing and retesting. Uh, that ties into another question about in incremental immunity. Um, I haven't seen any specific uh, literature that addresses incremental immunity. We all know it's real. It's something that happens. How much cross uh, incremental immunity is going to help you with the different strains? There's a long way from any, any clear understanding of that. Um, and how do you, there's no way, and I, so don't try unless you, if you've got a formula, let me know. Um, there's no real way to you know, calculate or come up with an equation for incremental immunity. Uh, hopefully, a lot of us are going to get that over time. This virus is going to be around for many years, at least two, and I would be surprised if it's not a lot longer in terms of our calculations of public behavior. Um, so testing frequency, that's really a calculus that comes out of who am I going to expose? You know, hey, I'm, for example, I've got this question from a number of people. You know, can I hug people? Can I get a kiss? Can I go see my grandkids? Those sorts of things. There's, um, that's a real issue. And that's another part of this carpe diem. Don't let this steal your life. Yeah, you know, if you're going to die, hey, memento mori. You know, that's another Latin one that means remember death. And if it's taking everything, of the, including the joy out of your life, I don't think that's worth doing. So in this back to how many, how often to test. Um, as often as you think there's some risk you've been exposed and you expect to put anyone else at any particular degree of risk. Um, so, you know, I'm going to, the grandkids, I'm going to go visit the grandkids. Let's take that as an example. Well, make sure you are tested before you do that. Make sure that until you see them, your behavior is impeccable. You didn't fill the car, uh, so you didn't touch the handles. You didn't uh, go shopping in that interval. 
you know, I'm tested. You know, you don't have it. Be impeccable until you put anyone you know or love or care about, which hopefully is all of us, at any level of risk. Okay. Um, so then if you're, you know, once a week, I'm going to go take care of grandma, you should be tested on a weekly basis. I just think that's the level of things that should be done. Well, you're going to tell me correctly, that's not practical. And that gets back to the testing regime. Since I don't, I'm not a fan of test and track just on practical, on mathematical grounds, to be frank, frank. Um, the testing should be more widely available. And the county that we're in now is, is really stepping up on that. But don't expect everybody's going to be able to get as many tests as they want whenever they want them. Uh, as long as the public health officials think, and I think it's an illusion, that it's going to help them understand the progress of the disease and they're going to make it free and you can get it, take advantage of that. Um, once we have a little bit more of a stable environment, once we've stepped out of a little bit of this uh, lockdown environment and we start to see what the kinetics, the rate of disease is, then we can come up with an answer to that question. But in any case, how frequently? Anytime you expect to put somebody you directly know and care about at any level of risk, I would want to know that I'm not positive. So that's how often I would do it. And that's, that's my answer on that one. It's not very, I wish it were as simple as never or always, but we don't have a choice between those two. So I hope that's some guidance. Um, <clears throat> Right. That's related to this topic we just talked about, and that's do you hug or not to hug? Well, since I'm from Texas, I don't hug anyway. <laughs> no, sorry. Um, the, the, the fact is that there are viruses on uh, surfaces, including your soft surfaces like uh, clothes and so on and so forth. Um, if you have any particular risk, that hugging is there. Uh, because, and, and how can I say that and why? Because we, again, back to that liar in the mirror, we all imagine that we haven't touched our face or we haven't, uh, you know, touched our phone and then put it to our face. We all imagine that's the case, but usually it's not true. So you may, if you're contaminated, put others at risk, even with your, with your clothes. So, for example, in the scenario I talked about, you're going to go visit the grandkids. You know, you're tested. You know, we've got nice, clean, clean, yeah, we took a shower. We have nice, clean clothes on. Yeah, go ahead and hug them. Uh, but make sure that you've washed your hands and that sort of thing. The gloves may or may not be protection. I think they actually can sometimes be misleading. Uh, but that, that a consciousness of touching and others is really important to minimize that issue. Uh, incremental acuity, we talked. Oh, uh, one question about uh, if I don't have a roar, uh, how do I get that initial warm up? And that's. My favorite exercise, always, everywhere, any chance you can, is hills. If you have any hills around, go walk those hills, go run those hills. They beat anything. Uh, if you don't have hills, jump ropes good. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Even step-ups where you've got one step that you go up and down and up and down and up and down. There are a lot of ways to do that initial warm-up phase, but um, stairs are always a winner. Anytime you have access to uh, stairs. Um, so, you know, if you're having shoulder problems, think in terms of hills or steps or something of that sort, but you do want to get your, your heart rate up before you begin any substantial, certainly if you're going to do any intense interval work, and that should be at the front of your workout and that inclu should include some warm up before you get there. Um, what else you got? Yeah. Well, the incremental immunity is a real thing. We know that. Matter of fact, there's actually some uh, social uh, evidence, um, uh, sociological evidence of that in certain communities already. But we simply don't have enough to answer that question in any meaningful way. We know that it's not a single virion just because of the transmission patterns. And it's not, uh, you know, an overwhelming viral load. Uh, like we would see with Ebola, for example, where you just get it, you got it. Um, so we don't have enough precision there. You know, if we knew it was 100 virions, then it gets less likely that it's in micro droplets. Uh, but we just don't have those numbers yet. So that applies to uh, infectious load and um, uh, incremental immunity. Those are unknowns at this point. They, For what it's worth, there is enough known that none of those let numbers look scary, 
Okay, it's not one virion and gee, you've got it. And so that's good. So there's some sense in which um, there's a prospect that we'll come up with some version of a calculus for uh, incremental immunity. Uh, face mask, zinc, testing, yes, what do you got? Yeah, um, well, yeah. As you probably know, the where do you go if you're sick problem is uh, to some extent, and I don't know what the legality of this is, is governed by um, county health officials. And county health officials have made it pretty hard to get conventional medical care. They haven't made it impossible, but they've made it pretty hard, even to the point <coughs> of recommending that if you think you're sick, you don't go to your doctor's office, you just show up at the door and maybe we can swab you. Uh, we're comfortable here that that's an excessive uh, requirement. On the other hand, I do ask people to plan ahead and schedule when they see Phil for body comp. Um, and we've taken up the carpets and we're in the, in, the, in the clinic and we're squabbing down the floors and so on and so forth. And I'm surprised we still have door handles. We rub them so we clean them so often. Um, so it, it, this is an environment where it'd be safe to be checked. But um, it, the problem with that is even if I were to see, as we have, some people where that's a suspicion and we have the swabs for it, and it's no fun, by the way, any of you have had that test. Um, it still takes two or three days to know if you have it. And then anytime we suspect, suspect enough that you might have it, and we swab you or testing stations or swab, you should stay in absolute lockdown until we get the results. So keep that in mind when you're making any decisions about that. Um, some of the imaging uh, sites are now opening, they'll, they'll see, you know, gee, I'm having a heart attack, I've got to be seen, or gee, I have cancer that needs to be ongoing therapy. Those are, those, are, those are pretty much available now, even though those were for a while limited. But for more conventional stuff, it's getting a little better, and a lot of the places are now contacting docs and saying, hey, send us some patients. So that part of conventional care is coming back online. Um, I've got a number of patients, I wish a higher number than I wish, of people that need to see an oncologist or a new diagnosis for cancer or something like that. And those which are secondary or secondary tertiary institutions like Stanford, UCSF, they're still kind of behind on those kinds of schedules. Uh, but I think it's starting to move. Um, what else you got? Well, uh, so no. The X, let me give you some fun numbers here. Um, I think you can see this. So the one that most people look at every day or so is the one from um, Johns Hopkins, and that's this one. And if you look at this, um, you know, there's more and more testing done, but the uh, death rate, the, the lethality, isn't is usefully connected to how many tests are done. We haven't gotten anywhere near uh, testing the whole population, as you can tell. Um, well, positives, well, that's going to go up too. Now, there was um, the, the Stanford antibody study, which was in Santa Clara County. They used one from Premier, uh, a lab, which is a China-based lab. And the numbers that came out of uh, Southern California, uh, where they looked at uh, levels of antibodies in uh, Los Angeles County, they used the same test. Um, and that actually only checked for one uh, antigenic site. And so it's kind of a limited test. They came up with similar numbers. Uh, maybe 3% is a background level of people that are in infected. The real more important number, I hope you guys keep in mind, and I've, I've mentioned it to you, and that is the per capita death per 100,000. As of right now, uh, in the United States, we're sitting right at 0.4, per, 0.43 per 100,000. That just is not a big number, <laughs> you know, and that's, that's nationwide. That's not, you, you, that's not the hot spots versus the no spots. I mean, you know, for, we have, I have quite a few patients that live in, in Montana, and, you know, there's just no disease there. So you're not, you're almost zero risk of a super spreader and certainly even less risk for a microdose in, in fusion. Um, so there are certain variants, but across the United States, look at that. It's, you know, 
0.4 per 100,000. That's not a big number. Now, if, again, keep demographics in mind, you know, I'm this old, I have this many disease, I, you know, the numbers shift. But if you look across the population, this is a trivial issue. So per capita, if you look at, uh, look at this, if you look at the, um, you know, here is uh, in Belgium, the uh, death rate was 2.85 per 100,000. That's a pretty big number. That gets up to showing up where it's in uh, one of the big ones. Here's another one for Spain, 1.81, 1, 1.82 per 100,000. Uh, here's um, UK. UK is also one of the highest, but even this 1.42. This is, uh, well, Ireland's pretty good. Um, Italy, 1.35. And as you know, it, it was a lot in a short period of time. But again, if you calibrate risk it's not huge and we in this country we just simply are not at risk for overwhelming the healthcare system currently as least as anyone can foresee it but i can imagine that it's going to continue being higher or right, let me rephrase that i can imagine it's going to go higher again before we're through with this uh, but again by the time we get into a really uh, uh, increasing uh, infectious rate as we will um, where it's going to be lower that peak than this past peak. So in terms of national healthcare resources, we're in pretty good shape, really, really quite remarkably good shape. If we look in terms of, um, well, let's look at this other one. Um, yeah, this one up here. Well, <laughs> I actually, I don't, the only reason I'm trying to show you this IHME one is that was the one that everybody was focused on for a while. And as you know, they were wrong enough that they've kind of recalibrated a number of times. They come up, their projections about 150,000. Um, and that's just through August. I think that's low. Uh, but still, it's not a million. It's not two million. It's that number on that order. Um, does that address the issue you're talking about? Oh, the West Coast, East Coast thing. That's again, that's the, probably the China. Oh, probably the China's. Well, part of it has to do with the super spreader environment, and part of it has to do with the primary Chinese, Chinese strain versus, uh, put your microphone on hold there, somebody, please, um, is, again, primarily a Chinese strain versus European strain. They all came from China, but there, there were some, and by the way, there's a substantial genetic risk uh, or drift, you would expect to have 20, there's this uh, vir virion is around 30,000 base pairs and you'd expect, eh, you know, 30 base pairs drifts over the course of a period of time. This is not much above the normal uh, genetic drift. So it's not like this is some wildly mutating virus. Remember back to what I said, good news, it's a virus, bad news, it's a virus. It's mutating and we're getting different strains of it, but you will see uh, keeping in mind the super spreader, super spreader part of the calculation, there's clearly different strains at work in different parts of the country. Um, that's, that's my take on that anyway. Is that, uh, the, Phil's inter interpolating these, these questions, so I hope I'm getting it right. Um, there's a question on my production, but like, where would you make yourself, you yourself Well, you know no, yeah, I, I, that isn't, a, a number that's doable, but is wildly clearly unknown. We don't know what it would take to microdose. Oh, there's a question about lethality, and I may, but I, maybe I wasn't clear. Um, the lethality on the low end, in my impression, again, is uh, at least five times that of flu. Uh, I think it's probably more like 10 times that of flu. And any of those numbers, 0.5 or 1, um, it makes this uh, almost inevitably going to entail uh, several hundred thousands dead per year. I, that's just the way it is. And that sounds like a huge number, but again, that's back to if you get in terms of number of people who die per 100,000, eh, it's not that bad. And if you get back, if you dig into the demographics, most people have a pretty trivial risk. And for those of us uh, who have a higher risk, I think some pretty reasonable uh, acts of amelioration will help. And again, with this caveat of these super spreaders, I don't think we have a lot of practical uh, risk. 
um, if we're careful with the ways we've discussed. Now, there, one of the things, oh, by the way, uh, <laughs> I just saw this question and it was from someone I would not have thought of as the problem, but I have a number of people for whom this is the problem. And there was some question about overtraining. Uh, overtraining is going to defeat, in fact, uh, make worse the risk that the gains, the help that we're trying to get out of exercise. Um, overtraining really does undermine your immune system. It creates a fatigue that's different than, gee, I'm tired. It tr creates a deeper metabolic fatigue. Remember, I was talking about making your mitochondria to either kill or be killed. You actually kill the virus and the, oh, kill them and prevented them from then recovering and, uh, you know, replacing the ones that were damaged. <clears throat> so overtraining is a real issue. I have a number of overtrainers in the practice and uh, they've paid quite a health uh, cost for that overtraining effect. For those who are prone to overtraining, it's almost, it's back to that liar in the mirror. It's almost impossible to actually see it in yourself because for those people who are prone to that, exercise is so emotionally rewarding, it's impossible to see. But overtraining is a real thing, and it can do as much harm as no training at all. Let me see what else we got here. So, so we're, right, we're coming right up on the hour. And I want anybody and everybody to get off here at any chance that you choose or want to. Uh, I'll stay around and answer some more questions if there are any. But that was kind of the overview of what I wanted to get prevent, present today, and I hope it was useful. Um, there's lots more to talk about, but I thought we'd kind of keep it limited to what we've talked about so far today. <laughs> well, I, I mentioned that. If you look at... Um, yeah, since I'm talking about this 0.4 to 0.7 range per 100,000 die, um, and that's an, an annualized number. It's not an annualized number. That's the daily rate as it would translate to an annualized number. Keep in mind that the annualized number is about 900 per 100,000. So many times the current, but which would multiply out to get to be a meaningful number. Make it number three or four, maybe even five in terms of causes of death in the United States. That's not a trivial thing. Oh, I want to be good about letting you off at the hour. So I'm... It was fucking three to four. Oh, okay. Oh, so, oh some question about the uh, antibodies. And I think that's a good, good topic to, to cover. <clears throat> um, in the same way that there are going to be problems developing <clears throat> an immunization, because no one has even agreed about what's the right antigen and one of the words, in other words, what part of the virus should be the, and the body develops an antibody toward the right part. We don't even know that. <coughs> the one, the antibody test that we use checks for what are four uh, generally recognized important antigens. One is the glycoprotein, uh, one's the nucleoprotein, and then the two are spike proteins um, on unique, well, on, uh, not unique, rather characteristic of viruses in general. And so antibodies to those four points, um, if you have antibodies to those four points, and then you've got more likely to have really useful uh, antigenic uh, reaction to them as opposed to having one or two of those antibodies, we're not even certain that those are the right four antibodies. Those four <coughs> antibodies come out of older uh, data on both SARS-1 uh, and Ebola as important uh, targets for antibiotics. <clears throat> so the uh, next thing you'd want to know is, okay, I have antibodies to those four antibody antigens or maybe more, and then you'd want to have it quantified. What is an adequate number of those antibodies to confer true immunity even against the one that you've already had? Um, the other thing to keep in mind, a lot of times, this is back to this, just a virus. It's not something else. It's a virus. Many people are testing positive again after they've recovered. And all those are dead particles that, you know, the body can't differentiate between, well, it can, but these tests can't differentiate between live particles and dead particles. Therefore, that takes care of this, oh my God, I've, I've got it again. No, you don't. You're just shedding those dead viruses. So, um, the, the getting this disease is a one-time occurrence, but for how long is it that one-time occurrence is an open question. 
uh, antibodies uh, decay over time. They just do. You, usually within weeks or months, sometime within years, but someone, somewhere in that range of weeks and months, I was what I would count on and nothing more than that. Anything else? Come on, guys. I want to answer questions, but I don't want to keep you on here forever. Um, oh, back to, to look. I want to address a question that was brought up last time, and I didn't, didn't cover it very well. Someone asked about the Swedish model as opposed to the Norwegian model. And I said, um, I don't think we know enough about the Swedish model versus the Norwegian model. Here's why. We don't have good therapies. If you can stick around until we come up with therapies, that's better if you die a you know, week before they come up with a cure. That's kind of a false promise in too many people with heart disease and cancer, but it's actually a valid thing to think about in this setting. So if you can hang around a little longer, you might make it till we have therapy. We do not have adequate therapy at this point. Um, so back to the Swedish versus Norwegian model. We all hope we'll reach some kind of herd immunity. I don't think we're going to reach herd immunity that will take care of the issue. We will reach a kind of herd immunity that will take the uh, dynamic nature of the risk off the table. Um, but uh, even though I want you to hang around long enough that we have a adequate therapy, I think that it's the <clears throat> most milder forms of social distancing and appropriate use of masks is about the level at which most people need to be concerned. I'm trying to be reassuring at the same time telling you this is going to kill hundreds of thousands of people. I hope you can put those two thoughts on the same page. Oh, um, let's see. Vaccine or medicine? Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm I, I'm hoping for a medicine, to be quite frank, because um, I'm not real hopeful of a uh, immunization therapy that's going to be in place for probably a year or two. And I'd like to have some therapies before that time. How is Phil doing? Phil is... Phil, well, it says you and me, you guys. Phil is, uh, the more time I spend around him, the cuter he gets. How about that? <laughs> I don't get out enough. That's what that means. Um, yeah, he seems fine. All right. Anything else? What else we got? Oh, uh, good question. Uh, if you go to the hospital, uh, for those imaging, I said we're starting to be opened up to getting access to imaging. Um, most of these imaging places I've talked to, and I haven't watched them, but as I've talked to them, man, they, they swab it down just like we swab the floor down. They're clean. Um, and for things like colonoscopies and biopsies and stuff like that, <clears throat> they observe uh, respiratory sterility anyway. And I would feel comfortable going to get a colonoscopy or, you know, a bi matter of fact, I've got to get some more cancer carved off my head. I'm not going to you know, I'll get it done. I won't think about it. Um, so I, I think most of those places are, are, are good for that sort of thing. Stanford took longer than UCSF and some of the local places to open back up their uh, imaging centers. Uh, but I don't think they did anything unusual, but at least they're back online for most things too. Uh, what else? Well, I can't help you with that. It's public space. Um, you know, the, the, I guess we've got multiple, how about bathrooms? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'm trying to imagine what the, you know, are you at the, re, at, a, at the filling station? You know, uh, make sure you have some gloves uh, in your car that you take uh, fresh gloves when you go in. Um, and yeah, you might practice levitation if you have to sit down. Um, um, I, I don't know if levitation is an option for you, but I certainly would not uh, make contact with a, with the toilet seat without some kind of a barrier. Uh, but as far as I did, if you did those things, I think it's fine. Did we? Yeah, we don't know about that. And I, okay. Um, does anybody want to maybe, I just, since we, the hour's up and, most of you, I hope, are gone. 
Uh, do you want to, uh, you want to take your, go ahead and ask some questions. Maybe is the thing to go. All right. Anybody? Maybe what about I haven't plane, covered it. What about plane travel, Mike? Uh, it's, I wouldn't travel now if I could avoid it. Mm. Now, the, with the next question, the follow-up question, which you didn't ask is, uh, when, um, I'm thinking fall or winter before I would be interested in, uh, pleasure travel. Fall or winter. And even that's going to be a peak time. Fall or winter. Dr. Mike, are we going to see some spikes in Georgia and Texas and all these places that have not had much lockdown and opened up early and people running around on the beach and, uh, going into bars and well, partying and all this, <laughs> this, uh, well, now that's, there's some data on that. Uh, one, I don't know if you saw the, uh, uh, because of the Florida thing where there was some, uh, like, what do they call it, spring break, there actually wasn't much, uh, there didn't seem to be any super spreader activity after that. In other words, they tracked by phone the people that were on the beaches in Florida during that time. And, you know, I want to be a little careful about how precise that information was. But it looks like they didn't take uh, big accounts back to their communities. And that was, that was a surprise to a lot of people. And I think the, the variable there is, again, back to this notion of the super spreader. Um, they just may not have been sick enough at the right time in the right place to cause an outbreak. But they have phone data on all those, well, not all, but a, at least a good percentage of the people that were in Florida at spring break. And they went back to various places, some as far as California, many of them to the Midwest where they don't have an ocean and um, they didn't take much back with them. It didn't appear to be. So to your point, uh, I guess I would say beaches are fine, but parties are not. Uh, again, that, the, the risk behavior, let's be frank, as it were, the risk behavior of younger people, uh, they're more likely to congregate. They're more likely to be around uh, in more cl uh, close physical proximity. So I would think of something like a bar, as probably one of the most uh, risky environments. Um, so I don't know what the bar behavior in Texas or Florida, I, I mean, I'm, I'm such a boring guy. I don't really have a way to calibrate that, but those are the risk environments. I don't see any reason you can't jump on the ocean if you want to know the answer to that part of the question. Uh, does that answer your question? I hope it does. If not, let me know. Hey, Mike, I know you're not an educator, but do you have any idea as schools and kids going back and, and that whole environment? Interestingly enough, and this is preliminary data, um, it, oddly enough, it doesn't look young people. I think the data they have is up to 10, so I don't, I don't know about that. And it's, you, you kind of not, can't be real clear about how this data is done. The, the study designs on these things are kind of ad hoc. They're made up as they go along. It doesn't look like there's a lot of up spread. In other words, really young people to older people. Um, so they may not be, they may not shed as much. And that makes sense in some biological ways. Um, so they probably are not uh, big spreaders among themselves. If this data on up spreading is true. Um, I think the, the people you'd worry about are the administrators and the teachers more than the kids. And I don't mean uh, just that they would be uh, more prone to illness, but they're more likely to catch it um, from one another. Um, so I think the, the value there, and this is why it was back to this whole thing of practicing presence and renewing uh, meaning and purpose. I think that's the real danger I have or worry about with young people is that just they're lost. They're emotionally and socially and psychologically really at risk from this. Um, I see I, 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 many, many, many of my patients are depressed now, even if they've never experienced depression. And they say, oh, I'm doing fine. Well, you're not really doing so fine. You're talking depression and anxiety, and you didn't used to talk to me about that. I think this is having a pretty profound psychological effect on people, and children would be very vulnerable to that directly in their own experience of interrupted socialization, but also in their downstream effect from parents and stuff who are also being affected by this. I'm concerned about that. Good point. Maybe Anybody grandparents else? get in and help. I'm sorry. Maybe grandparents need to get in and help. <laughs> yeah, and we need some uh, surrogate grandparents. People without grandparents, <laughs> go be one to somebody. That's right. 
<laughs> be a grand friend, right? Be a grand friend. That's right. <laughs> All right. Um, yes. Thank you. Anybody else? Because I. Do you uh, expect? Do you expect the number of cases uh, to go down over the summertime and then increase again in the? fall and winter as some people say or well what i that, that's a good question i the, do not does, believe does the season have any effect on anything yeah. <laughs> I, I think the so. season has less effect than the social behavior of the seasons in other words i don't think mm -hmm. this is one where it's going to warm up and the mean temperature is going to be 15 degrees higher that's going to kill more viruses mm -hmm. i do not believe that's an issue i do believe that you see different social behavior with the seasons and that can affect and all infectious disease of all kinds. So back to the point about the good news virus, bad news virus, is this is like that. And back to the whoever asked the question about uh, you know Texas and Florida starting to have spikes. They're going to have spikes if they're going to all go to the bars. They're going to have spikes in that sense. They're not going to all have spikes if they go to the beach, um, or at least the beaches I used to go to. Let's put it that way. And so um, it's seasonal only in that behavior, social behavior is seasonal. It is not going to die off in the summer and that sort of thing. And uh, areas that have kind of continuous seasonal behavior, whether it's warm or not, I don't think the seasons will make much difference in terms of the uh, spread of the disease. And I've got some evidence for that. It's not just a off the cuff remark, but go ahead. Anybody else? Yeah, Mike. So the question about, um, are the labs open for blood work, for the blood, blood draw? Yes, they are. Uh, I encourage people now, at least for now, to continue as much as you can to use uh, uh, you know, a private uh, phlebotomist like Kim, uh, just because in the setting of the laboratories, especially some of the ones right by the hospitals, people are in and out of there so quickly and two or three people are sitting in a waiting area waiting, even though it's not crowded and you don't, and you're more likely to see somebody sick waiting in a waiting room in a lab than you are somewhere else. I'd like the idea of one-on-one -on -one with somebody like Kim, uh, that private phlebotomist, but yeah, they're available. And I just, just do the calculation, super spreader, uh, aerosolize, fomites, uh, you know, secretions, who's sick, who's connected or, 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 or you know, collated. Um, I'd rather use it one-on-one -on -one in a private setting for my blood draws for at least the foreseeable future. Because let's face it, I've been in those labs. They're not sitting there wiping down the whole place every time one person leaves and another person comes in. Now, they will wipe down, and they're careful about this anyway, uh, the chair where you sit and where you put your arm and – you know, there are sterile needles and so on and so forth, but I have never seen them just plain old wipe down the uh, the tourniquet. Well, they've got 10 of them hanging out there. Have they all been in a you know, sterile bath? So there's some issues there. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're available, they're open now. But again, I would, own, for the, at least the foreseeable future until we can see some stability here, I'd avoid those other labs. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. Okay. All right. Oh, hi, Dr. Um, Mike. It's yeah. Kim. Could you please resend the exercises? And if you have any videos, that would be awesome. Well, okay. So videos, they're they're more for. If you go to the when you are serious um, website, is, when you're serious, when you're serious website. I think that's a dot com one. I have videos on there of the fundamental exercise like squats and deads and pull ups mm -hmm. and rowing and stuff like that. And those are videos that we made oh, 15, 20 years ago. They're still valid. <laughs> the, okay, the okay. <laughs> biomechanics haven't changed. And then the uh, exercise protocols that I sent out. Uh, what's nice about those protocols is they're validated. I mean, the, the you know the Journal of Preventive Cardiology was in, interested in that training protocol. So um, it works. It raises uh, VO2 max and you know, all these other issues. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. We'll send those out again. All right. Anyone else? Uh, yes. Dr. Mike, on yeah. the exercises you sent before you sent the whole Tempest. Yeah. Protocol. The whole template. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, are those the same for tier one and tier two? And it's just how much you get your heart rate up or I was. Well, okay. If you, if you remember tier one, tier two, three, 
Um, basically, most people will start with tier three exercises and as they get better, they ascend the tiers. Very few people can do the entire protocol at a tier one because tier one is Olympic lifting and super heavy deads and stuff like that. The, and the, the tier one is more what's called compound and whether there's multiple jo joints, more athleticism. So if, if to, just to start, if you use that protocol, go ahead and do it at all tier three, tier two. And once you're better and you, I mean, so I'm looking at some of you people right now, you know how to only lift, for example, you know how to do a good dead, make that part of that protocol uh, and plug that in where you can. Um, so you move up the tier system as you become more fit, strong and athletic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Somebody put up uh, Kim's phone number. Good job. No, I guess you can all see that, right? Um, now, you guys are just stuck here on your own court. I, I sent you all home an hour ago, but I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. I've got another, a few minutes if you want to ask. So, I, not... not, not uh, where are we, Phil? Oh, cool. There we go. Uh, Dr. Mike, you mentioned overworking out too hard. You have a son that might fit that. How do you know whether that's a case or not? Right. Well, that's one of the reasons I recommend doing the kind of testing that we do. You got to measure it. Um, I, I, I probably never felt better in my life when I was overtraining and killing myself. I mean, I, that was I'm, that's a confession from my misspent youth. Um, and had I continued in that behavior, um, they would have had serious consequences. A lot of people who are over exercisers are very sick before I see them. They have various disease. Yeah. 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 And so forth. The, what I recommend is you measure it and you know, what is their BNP, their heart strain, their, uh, you know, their ejection fractions on a treadmill. What's their VO2 max? Is it reasonable? Is it high? Is it low? Is it going down? Is it going up? Um, what is the HDL2B subfraction? You know about that one, for example. Um, a lot of times people will come in with moderately good HDL, HDL2B, and they say, oh, hey, look at what my exercise is doing for them. And then we take away or change their exercise, and the numbers will go up twofold simply because they got that much better and they were actually doing harm along the way. So, um, well, that's what I'm answering right now. You can't over, well, you, to answer your question, you can't know if you don't measure it. And I'm, I'm not dodging your question. I'm just saying the answer involves an array of tests to know if you're overtraining. Right, thank you. Thank you. This was great. All right. Let's, uh, let's give each other a break. What do you say? <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Mike. Thank you all for being here. Bye now. Thanks, Bye Mike. Now. Uh -huh. Take Great care. Job. Thank you, Dr. Mike. Stay safe. Okay. Thank you, sir. I'll try. You do the same. All Take of you. Care. Take care.